All right, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap. The folks at Harness always do a great job. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's webinar, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your question and answer tab and put your question in, and we will try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also happening at the end of today's webinar, we will be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you will be one of our four lucky winners. We also have a chat feature on today's webinar. So we hope to uh, get everybody engaged in communicating and, and uh, encourage you to go ahead and uh, submit any comments that, that you have during today's webinar. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off the webinar, which is Modernizing CICD in Financial Services. Our speakers today are James Fong, who is the Director of Engineering Ops at BNY Mellon, and Steve Burton, who is the CMO at Harness. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Shelley. All right. Well, Thanks, Steve, Shelley. I know you're going to be kicking things off. I'm going to take myself off camera, put myself on mute, and let you get right to your presentation. Great, thanks. Welcome everyone. Um, secret fact about James, he's actually an Atari aficionado, right James? Uh, yeah, among other consoles, but yes, that was uh, my first video game console that I received when I was a kid, yes. So. Um, Good believe it or not, we actually have that in common. Um, I had one of those as well on a, a black and white TV that I think was like 11 inches. That's how my introduction to technology came along. Anyway, yeah. For the next uh, 20 or so minutes, um, James is going to walk you through um, how he modernized CICD at BNY Mellon. Okay, so James's background is pretty extensive. He's been a cloud architect, um, he's run DevOps teams, um, and most recently, he's a director of engineering operations. And so his whole background, really, for the, the past 10 years has been in financial services. And so James has kindly agreed to walk us through his experiences and how he's gone about modernizing CICD. So good place to start, James. Why cool. modernize, right? Yeah, thanks, like. Steve. Thanks, thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, hey guys. So, yeah, why modernize? So, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background myself. So, um, I we started this uh, program that I'm in, um, BNY Mellon uh, Data Analytics Solutions, about you know about almost four years ago, um, and it was it was it's considered in the industry what we call a start in not a startup, but a start in, you know, a startup that's inside a larger corporation, but also um, we get the benefits of a startup, right? So we're funded by our parent company, BY Mellon, uh, to do two things. Um, the two big initiative was to build a, a uh, brand new spanking um, SaaS service uh, that would provide really cool products for our, not only our existing customers, but, um, you know, new customers that we could onboard. Second was to facilitate a, um, a digital transformation um, that we can transform all the different processes and pro um, existing products um, and technology that's already incorporated uh, within the company. Uh, so, you know, to to um, go up, to go about and start those two initiatives, um, you know, I I being one of the um, the founding employees in this program, um, seeked out to build a uh, a modern CI process, and eventually would graduate in CD. Obviously, a, a, a lot of folks will probably ask, you know, why don't you just go ahead and, you know, build up, you know, the CI CD process and choose all the tools. Can't really do that, right? Sometimes you have to start from, when you're starting from scratch, you have to, you know, learn how to crawl and walk and then run. Uh, so we took those steps and make sure that we got our CI in place, which essentially became our build factory. Um, so that the whole modernization process was a, you know, a massive journey, right? We set forth and sailed and started you know, finding different ingredients that uh, play critical roles in our CI platform. So such those things as such as uh, choosing um, the technologies that we're going to build upon to power our APIs. So we chose uh, Java Spring Boot uh, for UI. We chose uh, JavaScript Angular. 
uh, we you know we seek for and make sure that uh, we want to containerize every single application. So Docker containers was like a must. And you know as of today, we are still everything is containerized. Uh, we don't you know deploy in different fashion. Uh, so you know we we needed a a place to orchestrate and run these containers. So we started with Docker Swarm Swarm at the at the time. Um, you know, for Jen for for CI, we for the CI platform and server, we had Jenkins. Uh, we we had Artifactory and SonarCube, among other different technology stacks that you know became our CI factory. Um, you know, we try to adhere to some of the the latest and greatest patterns and things that actually make sense for us and fit in our organization. So we we heavily practice uh, you know the kiss and dry methodologies uh, in the development world. You know, we try to heavily codify everything. Uh, template everything and has you know have as few much lines of code as possible. Um, so you know this took years of effort, right? It started with me uh, being the initial employee, uh, um, and then uh, as a DevOps engineer, sorry, and you know slowly sort of grew a team into like six, um, you know, by year two, and you know by that time, you know we we had a we had literally no services to a test service and graduated to a set of you know, a dozen different microservices that actually powered our first gen uh, SaaS service, um, all actually in, in our internal cloud. And, you know, we I'm, I haven't even got to a point where we, you know, eventually move all this stuff to Azure yet. Uh, so, you know, microservices, right? Some of the stuff that, that are, um, you know, that we built, like I mentioned, is uh, Java Spring Boot applications that were running all inside um, Stalker Swarm at the time. Uh, you know, we needed a way to be able to deploy those uh, in an automated fashion. So we got the, like I mentioned, sorry. Oh. And just to give some, to give the audience some kind of size of scale, how many microservices are we talking about? Um, at the time, we, you know, we went from nothing to about like a dozen backend services. Um, you know, we, we had a few customers that were piloting with, um, you know, that had, business use cases that we needed to fulfill that um, we couldn't fulfill with our existing in market product. So, you know, those are the candidates that we chose and then we built those uh, around um, Java Spring Boot APIs and at the time was powered by a backend uh, with Fortinworks, right? And that's all on-prem yeah. cloud at the time, so. And the, the growth of those microservices to today, I think you mentioned you had a few hundred, like what does it look like in the environment today? Uh, yeah, so, you know, we. Between that time to now, we we you know that that same the same team that built those um, that dozen microservices that that is the team that what we call Vault uh, Data Vault today, right? It's our um, horizontal platform uh, that plays many roles. It facilitates data ingestion, um, data acquisition, and even a data fabric, which is a um, really cool custom engine that provides um, uh, a way for a customer to utilize uh, SQL, a uh, customized type of SQL to extract data and utilize data and visualize data. Um, so that still exists, but that has now expanded to about, you know, two to three dozen microservices just for that team. And then we have since onboarded, you know, uh, three different vertical teams that sits on top of the data vault um, that, you know, uh, builds more high level like type products using the same uh, Java Spring Boot applications. And in addition, you know, we have since adopted uh, Python applications too. Um, and, you know, with those two, now we're powering about like 120 plus microservices and we're still growing daily. And that's all running within uh, AKS, um, you know, Kubernetes service today in Azure. Oops, Steve, you're on mute. How would you describe CICD then? I think you mentioned like herd and cat cattle at the time. I think we've got a nice visual here of what that looks like, but um, could you share a few stories of what delivery looked like um, at the beginning of that journey? Yeah, so if we track back to, um, you know, the days where we had that um, a dozen microservices, right? So, you know, we we built it and we celebrated and, uh, you know, then the next, the next uh, logical step was to, you know, deploy these into a downstream environment. So, you know, so what, while the DevOps team was, uh, you know, all hot and heavy building out what we have as a future stage in prod. Um, you know, we had to think about how we can actually uh, automate these type of deployments and make it as less painful as possible. You know, the initially these deployments were we 
um, along with developers and product uh, product owners, uh, we decided that we were going to have a, uh, a ceremony, right, uh, for deployment, you know, sort of a little release management ceremony of sorts. That was a biweekly um, event. Um, so we scheduled it, uh, sort of a cadence. We got together in the Slack channel every two weeks. Uh, and then, you know, it was, it was a, it was a lot of manual tasks and not every single thing was manual, but there were certain aspects of things where DevOps had to do a lot of stuff, um, you know, the night before to prep, it's almost like prepping a meal, make sure you got all the, uh, the GitHub, you got, you cut GitHub releases for all these dozen microservices, coordinate with, um, you know, the different development team to make sure that release is supposed to go out, not the version before that sort of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, you gotta update, you gotta update your Confluence wiki for that release and make sure that all your ducks are in a row. And then the next morning you do like a quick poll in Slack, right? In that, in that Slack channel and make sure like every team's on board. They're, you know, they're alive and everything. They're ready to deploy. If there's issues, uh, you know, we, we need, we need, we know who's going to tackle it and who's on rotation that, that, uh, that day. And you know this happened for a few, a few months, right? Um, and and initially it was it was awesome because we got to uh, work with everybody very closely. You know, everybody got to um, eventually uh, felt like they owning a part of this release process. Release process. That being said, it gets tiresome though after a few months when you start scaling up uh, really quickly. People want more features more quickly, and um, you know teams now don't really want to be part of the process, not because they don't want to, but they they are also have pressures to build new features and fix bugs and do other things than add, allocating a dedicated resource to run this ceremony, right? Including me, myself and the team. Uh, so this is sort of where we started having questions about how do we bring this to the next level and automate this entire ceremony, right? And then that's when we sort of seek out and started looking for different tools that can do this, we can incorporate. Got it. Hey, we've got a question from Jamal. Um, did you integrate CICD in a legacy apps or is this just net new applications that we're talking about? Uh, these are net new applications. Got it. Okay. And so um, kind of getting under the, the hood in the cattle and, and biweekly deployments, I think you mentioned as well, like the tool sets you're using at the time, you started with CI and it was very mature. Um, can you share a little bit about those experiences and, and kind of what led to that that shift in mindset? Yeah, so I know the slide says Jenkins was becoming old, but I, I actually love Jenkins, the team loved Jenkins. Um, there's nothing wrong with Jenkins, but uh, just to clarify, right? So we still use Jenkins CI for CI, for the purpose of CI today, and we still heavily using it. And that's great, uh, we're, our pipeline is uh, completely centralized, um, it's all in Groovy code. We have a single repo that just facilitates a row of um, all our different pipelines and then we don't have disparate pipelines and nothing is wet. Uh, and it works very well. Uh, and then we try to actually retrofit Jenkins to also play the role of like CD. That is sort of when we sort of, um, you know, um, hit a roadblock or a ceiling because um, you can certainly do it with um, in Jenkins if you have enough imagination and you know um, coding talent, and we do. But the the problem is it's the cost, right? So if you allocate you know your best engineers to uh, spend time in uh, writing something in Jenkins and maintaining it, that you can actually pick up something off the shelf in the market that pops possibly could do it better with a really you know with an amazing support team and such. Then why would you go forth and do that yourself? Uh, when you can actually spend time and, you know, and energy to help the organization become a better um, a SaaS company, right? Make the product better rather than focusing on just building tools. So, um, yeah. so that's why we we went out and uh, start seeking out different solutions. And if we think about what is success for modernization, so you've done a great job talking about kind of the reasons why to modernize and and kind of the, the current style, the tool sets you're using. But as you looked forward, like what were the key requirements you had? How did you know your success? Like how how would you define it? Yeah, so I I define success uh, within the CI CD ecosystem in different ways. One in which um, we we can onboard um, different teams very quickly, right? Uh, and then we measure that um, to make sure that it doesn't take let's say hours or even days to onboard you know an entire team. And then within that you know, there's 
teams will have different requirements to move really quickly. Uh, when I say move quickly, it's you know, ask us for new projects and repos, uh, get get strapped up in um, boot, sorry, get bootstrapped in the CI and get going and do their work, not running into issues, uh, roadblocks, right? So we've tried to measure all that, you know, different type of questions that get asked. You know, we take those things, you know, very seriously, and you know, because they are our customers. And then we take that back and try to either bug fix it or build features within Jenkins, the pipeline, uh, to make their lives easier. So, you know, when they're able to actually uh, finish the sprint um, without having anything that's CI related or platform related or infrastructure related for that matter, that hampered their uh, feature delivery, we know that we're being successful. Whether, you know, they started from like week one all the way to week 52, they're able to deliver, let's say, you know, 100 more features and they're not slowing down because of uh, DevOps or something related. We know that we're being successful. And then we knew that the bottleneck was the deployment piece, which is, goes back to that bi-weekly, so, which is why we needed to um, swarm together and figure out that solution. Uh, and then, you know, this uh, and then figure out how to attack that and solve it with uh, what we call today continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And on the topic of self-service, um, self-service can mean different things to different people. Um, for example, DevOps engineers can have self-service to the platform. They can build things. Um, developers can have access to the platform and they can do things. In your eyes, what does self-service mean? Yeah, so self-service doesn't mean that you're just building out forms uh, and then you know giving people you know a uh, uh, god mode access and they could do everything right. To me, that's that's more of a sandbox type activity and environment. That's not what we seek out to do, and that's dangerous. Obviously, um, you know there's, there's no there's no CISO in their right mind that would even let that happen. So that being said, um, self-service um, is is something that uh, you know it's it's a feature that we want to give the developers that uh, things that we consider like churn and toil um, you know that are repeated for example um, you know I'll, I'll give you a real life problem today like we still sort of struggle with something that sounds very elementary like um, being able to self uh, provide a self-service for developers to instantiate their own uh, git repository uh, safely and completely bootstrap right most of that is actually automated, but as of today, they're still uh, going to the DevOps team and re doing a request. That there, there's a good reason for that because we want to have our GitHub repos uh, to be very, you know, it's very stringent. We want it to be uniform. Have it like we have a very standard set of nomenclatures, um, branch rules, and all that stuff in place and security, so people just don't go in there and basically, you know, turn our GitHub org into like um, you know some type of uh, playground, right? We it's it's a production area to us. The code is production. It's production. It's supposed to be production grade, along with the GitHub organization. But we want to get to a point where eventually we have that single self service. Um, you know, it could be something like Harness or some sort of like UI portal that they can safely log in with their ID uh, and again can just you know with a few clicks can instantiate those things or or safely destroy those things if they want, right? So, got it. And just uh, what, what's the audience? If you've got any questions as, as we're going through this interview, feel free to submit them in the Q&A window. We'll have a Q&A session at the end. And, and if certain questions come up that I think are relevant to, to the, the conversation, then we can inject them as well. So just wanted to kind of um, give you that opportunity. Um, so we talked a lot about self-service, reducing tile. Um, what did the evaluation process look like? Yeah, so the event, so yeah, just a, Take a step back a bit. So you know, self just, just continue on the conversation in self service. So I got the Git example, but you know, obviously there's also the example of um, having developers being able to push out their um, their microservices or their products by themselves, right? Which is a which is a daunting task. It's easier said than done. Um, and then you know, we're we wanted to. That, that was the end state. We wanted to get there and do it safely, um, you know, and have different gates um, uh, whooping, whooping that, uh, the product that can do that um, and guardrails. So that being said, you know, the DevOps team went out and, um, you know, did a massive sort of a POC slash POV against some of the best of breed um, products out there uh, that, that 
sort of uh, facilitates that CD type of solution, right? Uh, yeah. You know, I would also include sort of Jenkins in there, but we quickly sort of uh, put that one to bed just because uh, I mentioned earlier because of the engineering costs and dollars involved. So, you know, the four, there's four big players that we actually, uh, you know, um, evaluated, you know, were Spinnaker, Harness, uh, Cloud Beast, Flow. Uh, I don't know if they call it Flow now. Uh, if not, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize, Cloud Beast. Uh, and then Azure DevOps, given that we're uh, fully um, on Azure. So it was just in, it was natural for us to just quickly evaluate that. So, you know, do, do a very, uh, arduous exercise, um, you know, going back and forth, spinning up different POCs. Uh, you know, we, uh, long story short, we uh, ended up with Harness because it, it actually, um, if you know, if you, if I were to imagine and display a virtual matrix, you know, they basically ticked all the boxes that, you know, we, we had on the laundry list of things. Um, that includes being a, uh, it's a SaaS service, which was important to us. Uh, and, and I, and I harp on that because we don't want to get in the business of um, hosting or running our own stack, right? That's that's uh, not a situation that we want to get into, because you know one example is we don't plan on really stretching uh, and scaling with more and more engineers just because you know we have more tech stacks that we have to manage. That's that's not the business that we want to be in. Uh, you know our business has always been making sure developers have the proper tools and needs and can de deliver their features you know safely and easily. Uh, so having uh, a SaaS product like Harness, um, you know, with a uh, really large, um, talented uh, team of developers, along with a customer success team behind it, you know, make us comfortable being able to onboard and uh, use that technology. Second was ease of adoption, right? So, you know, as you know, I, I probably might uh, ruffle some fetters here with folks that like Spinnaker, but you know, as good as Spinnaker, you know, is when we tested it. It does require quite a bit of work to um, to get what you want and, and tweaking to get what you need, right? Uh, and then, you know, based on our assumption, um, you know, from from uh, um, from results from doing our homework, you know, getting up to speed with uh, Spinnaker and productizing that would have probably take one plus year if we, you know, given the same amount of resource we're allocating in terms of engineering work to uh, to get it from. Uh, from scratch all the way to production versus harness, for example, a lot of stuff is already sort of out of the box. You know, a, 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 uh, Kubernetes integration, single sign-on, um, you know, all these different type of gates that you can add, um, you know, they have already have concepts of uh, allow you to codify things through their CI. So these are some of the things that, you know, that really uh, touched us uh, and, you know, um, made us want to actually, uh, actually on board and sign up with it. So. And the evaluation process, like how, how long did you spend? So, um, and, and the reason I think this is important is there's lots of solutions, there's lots of, like it's different solutions that have different fits for different problems. And so I don't think there's ever one vendor that wins in, in any use case or, or customer, but can you walk through like the timelines? Did, did you spend a few hours on each product? Was it a few days, a week? Like, was there a set? kind of punch list of things you wanted to test as, as you went through it? Yeah, we, we spent the one whole month on it, which was a lot of time, right? And uh, in, in our, um, you know, if, if you were, if we were to time uh, compare to different projects that we take on, normally we don't, we don't even, you know, we wouldn't spend close to a month to do a POC, but we wanted to get things right. So we, we allocated, you know, multiple different engineers. We, we sort of shot of that work. You know, we had engineers that were looking to harness while we're, we had other ones that were looking at Spinnaker and Cloudbees, uh, and then you know we we obviously uh, have stand up and we week uh, twice a week I remember um, just to discuss the specific specific topic, uh, you know, and then we had you know basically sort of did a SWOT analysis of sorts of people still know what that is uh, to just uh, figure out what what are the things that will work for us, and you know at the end of the day it was harness right. Um, that, that made sense. So that's why we ended up reaching out to you guys and uh, started that conversation and onboarded. Oh, you're muting him, Steve. So you mentioned SaaS, and SaaS in financial services is often uh, a challenging conversation. Um, how did you approach it, and how did, how did you think about that within, within the bank? 
So th there might be many people on the call who are in financial services where SaaS tools is is, is kind of, uh, how can I put it, a challenge. Um, how, what was your experience? Uh, yeah, uh, ch challenge. Uh, yes, it's definitely a massive challenge. Um, I would say this, when, when we started uh, the program four plus years ago, there, there were a lot of people in the, not only industry, but within the company too, you know, that, you know, that basically sort of um, you know, not have a negative impression, but, you know, didn't, didn't see how a financial company can become or provide a SaaS product um, like, like a software company like Netflix or Facebook, right? They just didn't see that within that fintech market, there was a stomach for it, partially because um, if you look at all the different uh, banks and organizations out there, they were very hesitant to even move their footprint into the public cloud. Uh, so, but you know, us being like the founding um, engineers, we understood that that was the future, right? Eventually, things will move to the public cloud. Right? Your entire data centers that we we own will, you know, one day completely disappear. It's going to be on one of those big clouds. And same thing with products. There is no way in any scalable uh, form or shape you can continue to have enterprise type software where you have folks go out and deploy on prem. There's no, there's no, there's no on prem place to deploy. Other customers are going to be on the cloud too. So, uh, you know, building building a SaaS product just makes sense. But we have to figure out, um, you know, do this arduous journey on how to build it. Like I mentioned earlier. You know, we built this a SaaS product actually on prem first. You know, we started with um, a lot of open source tools. Um, you know, like Docker Swarm. Uh, you know, EXX. Uh, you know, blades that we're using, providing VMs, uh, and then we hosted it. You know, uh, we hosted it out. Um, but it's it's one of the the first ways we were able to do that. And eventually, we graduated and you know got approval from our parent company to to use a public cloud, and then we we'll move all that stuff over. Um, and we're able to do that because, you know, we, we follow a very uh, agile methodology, uh, you, know, you know, we follow best practices and we got all that stuff up and running. And obviously, you know, we, I also want to thank uh, all the, the talent engineers that we have in our organization, you know, to be able to execute that. Got it. And what about the results? So you've kind of gone through the process. SAS is a good fit. Um, if you look at today, um, what do the results look like? I, I know this is a screenshot showing that the number of deployments, but what, what's been the results of the modernization? Yeah, so the results of modernization as of today, um, you know, we have multiple different business lines. And if you're, you know, if you just Google and search for BY Mellon data analytics solutions, you know, we have, uh, you know, press releases talking about um, the SaaS product. And there's a, there's a lot of different offerings around it, uh, such as data analytics. ESG, uh, Data Vault. So there's all different solutions that are around it. And all this stuff is hosted and in, in directly in Azure. Um, and it's a multi-tenant uh, service, right? It's not behind the scenes. It's not, you know, we're not onboarding customers and then uh, creating, um, you know, six or seven different environments for, for, um, for customers. It's nothing like that. You know, those are the, those are the sort of the legacy days of doing things. We, we have very, very few subscriptions in Azure. We have three subscriptions. And we have a single prod subscription that hosts every single customer safely, right? It's all virtually segregated. Um, and you know, to to do the to do these things in a you know a, in a massive uh, and rapid fashion, right? Deployments where you know this is a harness comes in. Developers log in logs in at their own cadence, and developers and the teams, and even POs, product owners and product managers, can log in uh, with their IDs, right? A single sign on. They go in. We have a uh, a stage and prod pipeline that we we provide to them. Like DevOps built that pipeline and it's tested thoroughly. We ensure that it has all the right gates and guardrails, and then they're able to just choose the products. Uh, and they only can see their own products. So if you're in team, if you belong in team X, you can't just deploy team Y's product, right? That's where sort of the ACO and privileges that um, that comes out of the box and harness, right? You know the reason why we chose it. Uh, and then do that. They just literally choose. I think two options right now is uh, you know the the uh, the artifact, which is like in the Docker container, the feature that they want to deploy, and a version you know that is blessed. Uh, and they just put that, and then they just click submit, and it goes through these this really cool pipeline, uh, the deployment pipeline. 
uh, that goes to all these different stages and then it deploys into a, a stage description run automated functional testing, and then you know any of those guardrails or uh, stage breaks, you can't move further. And then we also have a manual approval process in which you know if if stage is actually is all good and green, it stops. Uh, uh, the manual approval stage kicks in. It uh, talks to Jira, uh, submits a um, a Jira ticket into the. Uh, we have a special board just to facilitate this, and it assigns it to the product owner to evaluate, to make sure if they want to continue to go, I mean, continue to have this product to deliver to prod. And then if that person clicks yes or no in JIRA and submit, then it sends a webhook back into um, Harness, and then it triggers the prod part of the pipelines and goes through the same exact rigor. Uh, and then after which your, you know, your product and features magically there, you have a new version of API that's now up and running. Uh, without having a single DevOps engineer Having to babysit, uh, you know, and and chaperone. Got it. So I think there's two things you mentioned there. One is you templatize the deployment. So it sounds like you've got your deployment pipeline through all the different environments, and all the teams, the dev teams do is inject their artifact, pick a version yeah. number, and that's the input to the pipeline. It runs through the security checks, the test checks, and by the time it reaches production, it's gone through the guardrails and and the I guess the standard deployment process that that the DevOps team or the, the the engineering DevOps team kind of defines is that that correct? Yeah, and as you can see on the screenshot, um, you know we're we're doing about over seven thousand deployments as of today, uh, and this is tracking the last thirty days, right? Uh, the screenshot from Harness. Uh, so that that's across all our three subscriptions. Wow, so which is amazing. That includes. You know, canaries, development, CI, um, you know, and downstream yeah. uh, deployments. Got it. Um, question from Matthew. You just mentioned canary deployments. Matthew asks, do you do blue green at all? That's a good question. So we don't do blue green in the traditional sense where it's blue and then green within the AKS cluster. We do the blue part in a stage description. Um, and then the green part, it's going to be in prod. Uh, we do this things, well, to be transparent, and I'm sure Matthew's a techie himself, um, the reason we don't do this is because we don't actually have a mesh service incorporated yet, uh, and a couple other things. And then we're we're actually, um, you know, we're actually tr trying to tackle that uh, problem this year. Uh, and then once we have that all in place, uh, whether it's Istio or console mesh, um, that's when we're going to actually really tackle blue green. Among other things, obviously, it's the maturity of our APIs too. Uh, you know, API versioning, we're trying to move toward a much, much more streamlined API versioning scheme, like um, media info versioning versus like path versioning. So those are the, some of the things that has to, all these things have to come together before we can do like a true in cluster blueprint. Got it. And I think the second thing you mentioned is you've natively integrated change management into the pipeline. So as artifacts move across the environment, the actual pipeline itself generates the tickets and notifies the people you need to approve it. The artifact is at this stage. Um, is it just, are you just using that for Jira or is it, are you integrating that with ServiceNow as well? Some customers tend to have both depending on operations and development teams. Yeah, great question. So we, we don't, so our organization DNA don't use, um, you know, we do use ServiceNow, but that's um, solely used to track like IT Type tickets, right? Or IT help desk. So it's not used within our product or our developers and uh, you know uh, and DevOps. So we we uh, we use uh, Jira uh, for everything. So that's why we integrated with Jira. And you're right. Um, we got that uh, change approval process uh, automated. Um, there's business rules around it, um, and and uh, it works with ServiceNow too. What's interesting was, um, you know, when we actually talked with a harness. About integrating, I think ServiceNow at the time, I might be wrong. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, ServiceNow actually had more features and in integration, uh, and then we actually work with uh, Harness uh, to add features in Jira, so we can feel comfortable in um, incorporating that, in which they have done. So, got it. Um, and you mentioned so today you, you've got roughly a few hundred microservices. Um, question from Ray is really like, how many people are dedicated? to managing the CICD pipeline? 
Ah, good question. Um, so the team makeup is um, it's it's about it's about a half dozen uh, DevOps engineers that spread across um, you know, two different continents, right? So we have a team in Wellesley and team in Poland. Um, so among these half half dozen um, engineers, um, they they all have similar skill sets in the sense where you know everybody is essentially sort of a, a SEAL team, a SWAT team type member. We don't have like a single member in the team that specializes in like database um, administration, engineering, or you know like we have a specific infrastructure engineer. Everybody, it's pretty well worse. Uh, you know the best term or to label is like sort of a full stack type DevOps engineer. So you know you, you can have engineers that can take on uh, just you know looking at an issue uh, on our DevOps Slack channel. And they quickly switch to uh, taking on a story uh, to uh, uh, codify permissions in Snowflake, uh, which is a data warehouse that we use in the back end. And then they can switch back to uh, working on uh, fixing a, uh, a a pipeline issue in Harness, right? If we have some or, or add features in our um, Harness pipeline. So it's a very flexible team. They could be doing anything at once. There's no dedicated like, you know, support. Uh, there's no silos per se. So. Got it. Um, question from Teresa: How do you manage remediation of issues? So, if there's uh, an issue with a deployment or a deployment fails, how is that handled? Uh, happens real time. Uh, so, you know, we we have specific channels for deployment. Uh, it's literally, deployment dash blah 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 in Slack. So we see that light up. Um, we immediately tackle it. You know, we anybody in our team, including myself, um, sort of just drop things and then immediately look at it because we're, we're sort of like trained to, to understand and look at those channels and P1 channels. Uh, and then we look at it and then we quickly, you know, we just log in the harness and see what's wrong, right? Uh, a lot of times it's uh, basically could be a container, could not launch. Um, a lot of times it's functional test failures. Then we just dig through why the test fails. And then a lot of times it's uh, data related, right? Uh, uh, expected data did not exist in that environment. So we work with the, the development teams to, uh, to fix that and figure things out and then try to move on to the next step. So. Correct. And um, final slide, what, what, what lessons have you learned? So you said it was a four year journey. And so what advice would you give to people in your shoes who are looking to modernize the ICD? Uh, yeah, questions. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, if you're going to start from scratch, uh, definitely take your time. Uh, don't don't rush in to pick your the correct ingredients, right? You know, just think of it as like a, you're starting up a, a fast food restaurant. You got, you got to understand what you're actually going to be serving So, uh, and what you're serving with. Um, don't think about, you know, choosing the latest and greatest. Uh, you know, I'm just using the example. Don't, don't shoot me. But like, you know, for example, just because, you know, Go or Russ is like the coolest thing right now, you know, you got to really choose carefully what makes sense, right? It's also a combination of where you're at and where your uh, your footprint is in terms of talent. Um, you know, if you're if you're in an area where, let's just say, there's less type of uh, uh, talent or engineers that can write or build something in, in Rust, as an example, maybe that's not the right choice. Maybe you should look uh, in that, you know, do some homework in that area, uh, and then choose something that's uh, easy, easier to adopt and you know. Uh, talent on board and then figure something out. Uh, you know, you want to do other homework too, obviously to make sure like some of this stuff can easily be, uh, you can build upon, uh, choose the right tools. Um, for example, we use Grado as our, um, build CLI and we choose that because it's flexible, right? So things have to be flexible and very fluid, uh, just because it's a, you know, Grado, it's designed to build, uh, Java doesn't mean it can't build anything else. We're, we're using that to actually build not only Java and JavaScript and JavaScript and Python. So it works because underneath the hood, it's also, uh, you could say it's a script and testing tool. So we essentially turned that into our CLI. So, you know, choosing that tooling and scaffold is the most important. Don't get too ahead of yourself. Uh, and then just basically go all the way and think about, you know, CD, you know, built properly built your CI first. Uh, and then, and then look at uh, your CI tool also very importantly perhaps your CI tool might or might not be able to provide you CD. So that could be your decision too. If you really, if your organization's really just interested in keeping that footprint small, 
maybe you want to choose a CI tool that could do some sort of CD and make sure it covers those uh, uh, features and functionality features and functionalities that you need in the future. So, great. Thanks, for James, for sharing that. I think we've got some more questions as well. Um, question from Vinod. Do you have different roles, hierarchy on the team? Um, do you call everyone on the team a DevOps engineer or do the roles vary slightly? No, the teams are, the team structure is flat. It's really flat, um, you know, to be specific. It's, uh, it's myself and then the engineers. Uh, and then we have another team that focuses on a different uh, uh, a line of product, which you call our in-market product. And then, you know, we have a manager there along with he has team members. So it's relatively flat, you know, and I call myself a DevOps engineer too, or I try to be one. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're all doing the same things. So. Got it. Question from Daniel. Um, alerts, error messages, are they pushed to dev through tools like PagerDuty so that DevOps are not troubleshooting what is dev's work? How, how does that work internally? Yeah, so this goes back to years before when we were designing and you know uh, making everything um, in terms of like being a template uh, or coming out of a template um, or a base, uh, quote unquote, base solution. So we're fortunate enough to uh, Dockerize everything from scratch in the beginning. So as of today, we only have about three to four base images that everybody uses. So if you're building a, a Python service, for example, everybody's using that exact same base image, right? Because they have that laid out in a Gradle's property. So if you try to use some arbitrary image from like a Docker Hub, it's not going to work. Your pipeline is going to fail uh, and fail miserably. So you have to use a qualified image. And inside that qualified image comes with um, a lot of stuff that uh, we bake in so such as like a new relic apm uh, a bunch of like a part uh, python script we're doing for um, you know loading uh, environment variables as a sort of entry point of sorts among other things and logging um, is actually out of the box so we use uh since everything is actually uh, served in uh, aks um we have the luxury of using uh fluent bit uh, as our log uh, sort of aggregator and parser. So that the, it's a daemon set that runs inside all of our um, AKS clusters and that helps feed logs to its appropriate location. So right now we're using both New Relic logs and Azure Log Analytics. So from a developer standpoint, when they're deploying whether a canary or a, um, you know, or a mainstream uh, container that plays a role of uh, API, um, we have actually a homegrown dashboard uh, uh, call Infernator uh, that users can just log in and then they could just click on sort of a hot link for that service. It's a real time. Uh, and then it'll bring them to either New Relic logs or um, Azure Log Analytics with a pre filled query. Uh, and then they'll bring their logs up and then developers could treat the time series. You know, they want to go back in time or, uh, you know, shrink that time series to just focus on the last five minutes or, you know, just uh, uh, nail, uh, filter it down to just looking for errors. So all that stuff is in place for our Java and Python Spring uh, services. Correct. Question from Tejas. Um, how much auditing and audit controls is included in the pipeline? Yeah, so the, so this is interesting, right? So we, we constantly get uh, asked about, you know, what, what do we keep in terms of like uh, an audit trail? So from a pipeline perspective, you know, we, we're fortunate to have actually uh, engineers actually spend time um, you know, within the pipeline and added features to deposit all of the logs that you see in Jenkins that are console and uh, literally archive that and put it in Azure Blob. Uh, and it's in a, it's, it's structured. So you can actually go back in time and look for specific builds and you have all that asset. From, from, a, from a CD perspective, right? Deploying in the downstream, you know, Harness fortunately has a good series uh, set of like auditing capabilities and logs. So we can keyword search things that we want, uh, it stores, you know, up to a, a uh, it stores all these logs for every single deployment. So we can always backtrack and look. Um, in addition, there's always also a, the the log, the, the trail from uh, the Jira board. You know, if you remember what I mentioned about the uh, the approval process stage, and that creates a ticket. That ticket doesn't, you know, it's always going to be there. It's going to remain there forever. It's just going to change in terms of status. So we can always track that. Uh, and then we have different places of source of truth too. You know, we we heavily use uh, HashiCorp Vault and console. So there's different sources of truth that we could all tie together. There's, um, you know, all that, all those things together 
uh, basically are essentially our audit trail. Got it. Another question on automated testing. Um, what do you recommend for automated testing for SaaS? Is there any low code configuration or anything of that area? Good question. Um, we're so for our automated functional testing. Um, you know, we we also have a, a whole bunch of. Um, we had a team of estets uh, and you know quality infrastructure, right? That essentially um, wrote custom uh, Java and Python uh, libraries that wrap around you know stuff like Akka, um, uh, WebDriver, and uh, you know some other common components people use for testing. Um, and so this makes it makes it easier for developers to actually use those and incorporate and write uh, you know end to end test cases uh, inside their repo. Uh, when I say inside their repo, meaning you know our, our uh, one of our business lines at Data Vault, um, they they practice a pattern in which they write um, test cases end to end test cases in the same language Java that are stored inside that repo, and those test cases are executed as part of the pipeline in this a stage specifically. Uh, so it's it's a it's language native. Uh, same thing with Python. Uh, so it's not it's not like a singular tool or a separate team that's doing it. Uh, so but in terms of the question about low code, um, we're exploring something called like test them. I don't you know like I mentioned it's a exploration at the moment. Uh, so you know we haven't got there yet, but you know the stuff that we're using it's you know it's not really low code right if you're writing uh the test the test features in java so great and i think that brings us to 45 minutes so james thank you for sharing your experiences and walking us through the challenges and the journey of modernizing cicd um thanks to the audience for asking questions um if you've got any more happy to follow up on that as well um and i think we've got some prizes to give out Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Excellent, excellent. Well, yes, we do have um, we do have a couple minutes left for question and answer period. So if you do have a question, go ahead and get it on in. And while we're waiting to see if we do get any more questions in, um, uh, just a quick reminder that uh, today's event is being recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, you will have the opportunity to watch it later on on demand. Following today's webinar, we are going to be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. All right, guys, um, let's see. Let's do our uh, hand. Yeah, we do have the uh, four twenty-five dollar Amazon gift card uh, winners. So let's go ahead and do that. The the drawing for them. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. We've got. Okay, our first winner today is KCW. Congratulations, Casey. Our second winner today is Juan L. Congratulations, Juan. Our third winner today is Vanessa W. And our final winner today is Daniel B. Congratulations, Daniel. We'll be following up with all four of you by email to get your, your gift card over to you. Uh, so please check your inbox. And if you don't see anything there, please check your spam folder. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I do want to thank all of the uh, audience members who did submit questions. There were some really great ones there. And uh, I also want to thank our speakers today, Steve Burton and James Fong. Great presentation. Lots of great information there, James. I really do appreciate you walking us through how you guys went about um, uh, in, in your in your journey, uh, if you will, and um, especially you know when it comes to CICD, I know the financial services sector in, in particular can be kind of tricky sometimes when it comes to DevOps. So thank you very much for imparting the information. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. All right. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. And uh, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and please stay safe.